I am super excited to be here with you all today and talk about a lot of the really cool stuff uh, we've been working on at Apollo over the past couple of months. Um, so, as Lee mentioned, my name's Peggy Rezus, and I am an open source engineer uh, on the Apollo team. Uh, even though I'm giving a presentation about servers today, I primarily work on client-side tooling, and I also uh, travel uh, the world to speak with developers and give workshops and conference talks. Um, and yeah, I mean, um, I was just in San Francisco a couple days ago for Fluent, and uh, you know, whenever I'm talking to developers, I, I hear some common themes start to emerge. And uh, mostly the people that I meet are front-end developers, and they're all super excited about GraphQL and all the benefits that they'd stand to gain. But uh, oftentimes, they're having trouble adopting it in their own organization. And uh, usually, these front-end developers have some concerns as well about the server side of things. Um, and then on the other hand, the back-end developers that I meet, uh, they're usually not as excited. They kind of approach GraphQL with a heavy dose of skepticism, uh, and rightfully so, because I think uh, GraphQL's focus on product-first development represents a huge shift in their workflow. And these back-end developers are mostly concerned about things like performance and caching and maintaining control over their existing back-end services. And this, this disagreement, this uh, you know, kind of conflict almost between front-end and back-end engineers can really stall progress on GraphQL uh, in an organization for months and, and perhaps even years, um, as was the case at Airbnb. We really need to find a way uh, to compromise here between the two sides. The benefits of GraphQL, I mean, they're really hard to deny. We're, we're constantly building for new platforms all the time, mobile, wearables, VR, IoT, and we have all these separate clients uh, requesting data from a multitude of different microservices. And we have to really meet our users where they are, so we're constantly you know, building for new platforms, and we're duplicating all this logic uh, across our clients. And GraphQL is really what prevents the situation uh, from spiraling out of control. GraphQL also fosters collaboration between front-end and back-end teams. When the schema is a contract that both sides can adhere to, each side can really work independently with a common goal in mind. The front-end doesn't even need to wait on back-end changes in order to be productive. They can just mock out the schema and keep building their query components uh, before the data-fetching logic is even finalized by the back-end. And perhaps one of the greatest benefits is how GraphQL clients can reduce the complexity uh, associated with managing state in your application. Instead of writing complex code for fetching and transforming the data into the shape that you need, you just create a GraphQL query. An Apollo client will take care of making that request. It'll take care of caching it. It'll take care of tracking loading and error state, and, and as well as updating your UI. And I think whether your favorite client is Apollo or Relay or Urkel, I think we can all agree that managing state with any GraphQL client is a hell of a lot better than rolling your own solution with REST and Redux. I see some heads nodding. Um, so yeah, so like, how do we bridge this gap between front-end and back-end developers? To figure out a solution, we really have to look at the motivations be between these two groups and find some common ground. So front-end developers, they want to have a say in what happens with their GraphQL API, because at the end of the day, ultimately, they are the ones that are using it. And often, they're the ones tasked with building an initial server implementation in their organization or a proof of concept. So these front-end developers, they really need an excellent out-of-the-box server experience. They're also heavily concerned with uh, identifying and following best practices for things that they might be unfamiliar with, like authentication and schema design and testing. On the other hand, back-end developers, they want to ensure that their underlying services won't suffer performance hits as a result of shifting to GraphQL. And they're really concerned with things like caching uh, and monitoring as well. So their common ground here is, is really the server. So if we can design a better server experience, complete with advanced tooling to satisfy the back-end developers, and a great getting started experience to satisfy the front-end developers, maybe we can actually speed up GraphQL uh, adoption as a whole in our community. 
And at Apollo, this is exactly what was on our mind as we started to plan the next generation of Apollo server. So up until now, I've used the term GraphQL server, but I think sometimes the word uh, server can just be intimidating, especially for front-end developers who are just getting started. I think it's actually more accurate uh, to call it a GraphQL layer, since it, sits, it often sits on top of your existing data sources. And I think we really need to lower the barrier to building this layer here. Um, so it's achievable by product teams, since GraphQL APIs are often at their best when they're written by the product team that's using them. And in fact, layering GraphQL on top of REST is many developers' first experience with GraphQL. So this is really something that we wanted to make better with Apollo Server 2.0. One of the best parts of GraphQL is that it doesn't require an entire rewrite. You can actually just migrate incrementally and rather quickly by building a GraphQL server over your existing REST endpoints. One common pain point, however, is caching. Teams don't want to have to reinvent the wheel and re-implement their existing caching logic that they already have with REST when switching to GraphQL. Additionally, we, we really needed a better out-of-the-box experience. We were uh, super inspired by the awesome things that Prisma did with GraphQL Yoga to connect the dots between uh, all our separate packages like Apollo Server, GraphQL Tools, and GraphQL subscriptions. Um, and they really did. They created an excellent getting started experience that really resonated with developers um, for both GraphQL beginners and experts alike. So ultimately, our goal uh, for the next version of Apollo Server was to make developing this GraphQL layer approachable for everyone. We wanted to enable product developers to get started with GraphQL quickly and give them the confidence they needed in order to ship their layer into production. So with this goal in mind, we set out to totally revamp the Apollo Server experience. And after a few weeks in beta and hearing all of your feedback, we are so excited to announce Apollo Server 2.0. Uh, it's officially out of beta today, and if you haven't tried it yet, I think you're really going to love it. Um, just install uh, Apollo Server at Next to take, uh, take advantage of all the new features, um, and let's look at what some of them are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm super excited to uh, preview this all for you. You're getting really the first look. Um, so instead of giving you like all these separate tools that you have to wire up yourself, Apollo Server actually does that for you um, based on years of best practices uh, that we've kind of learned uh, from working with different companies. And with only a couple lines of code, you can get a GraphQL server up and running in minutes. Out of the box, you get an express server that includes our new error management features, as well as a health check endpoint, and advanced features like subscriptions and schema stitching already set up for you. I want to talk a little bit about the new error handling primitives, uh, because they not only improve the developer experience uh, for working with errors in GraphQL, they also get us to start speaking the same language about errors. So um, now you can actually just throw an authorization error, for example, in a resolver. And this new error primitive uses the extensions.code property in order to produce a human readable status code, which then you can kind of bubble up and check on the front end in Apollo link um, to perhaps implement a reauthorization flow. For more information, I highly recommend that you check out the announcement post by one of our interns, Clarence. And uh, after my talk, I'm going to post all of the links that I referenced today on Twitter. Um, so just be on the lookout for that. With Apollo Server 2.0, you actually get a GraphQL Playground automatically set up for you. So big shout out to the Prisma team for their awesome work on this. Uh, it really continues to be my favorite way to not only test queries, um, but to teach developers about GraphQL in my workshops. Yeah. <laughs> so also included in Apollo Server 2.0 are some production-ready features guaranteed to please even the most skeptical back-end engineers on your team. So we really wanted performance to be a first-class feature of Apollo Server 2.0. So we included response caching via the cache control directives and even reporting to Apollo Engine. Apollo Engine is our cloud service, and it provides deep insights into what's actually happening with your GraphQL API. It's actually never been easier to set up Engine than it is now with Apollo Server 2.0. 
All you have to do is just provide an API key as an environment variable, and Apollo Server will do all the heavy lifting for you in order to set it up. And some of these great features that used to require the engine proxy before are now enabled uh, by default in Apollo Server, which means they're 100% open source. Another one of those features that we're really excited about is automatic persistent queries. All you have to do to complete the setup process is just add the persisted queries link to your Apollo link chain when you set up Apollo client. And this allows you to send a hash instead of the full query text, which will improve network performance. It's also really useful for sending queries as GET requests, which allows you to cache them with, just, with a CDN, which we're going to be talking uh, a little bit about later. So don't worry if this is like an overwhelming amount of information. Uh, we're also really excited to introduce a new doc site for Apollo Server 2.0, which will guide you through all of the latest features that I just discussed. And Yanni, if you're tuning in on the live stream, this one's for you. All the new features are actually documented, and we're hoping to add more interactive examples on Glitch in the weeks leading up to the final release. So where do we go from here? The next part of this talk is going to cover how we actually see the future of GraphQL servers evolving over the next year, and how Apollo Server 2.0 actually moves us in that direction. Ultimately, our goal is to enable all developers, whether they're front-end or back-end or beginners or experts, to create a product-focused API and ship it to production. So what's next on the path towards this goal? Wrapping a REST endpoint is often the fastest path to GraphQL adoption, but the best way to achieve that hasn't really been clear until now. I couldn't be more excited about the really awesome work that Martin uh, on our team has been doing with the new Apollo Server Data Source API. It's a new way to wrap REST endpoints that takes care of all the data fetching code for you, so you just have to worry about writing your business logic. It also comes with a shared cache out of the box enabled to, um, in order to enable whole and partial query caching. And one of the coolest features is that it actually picks up on existing cache hints from within your REST responses headers. So you can actually reuse the existing caching logic that you already have. Um, but if you don't have something in place, you also have the option of specifying cache hints on the schema using the cache control directive. So let's take a look at what this uh, looks like in code. So all you have to do is just extend from this REST data source class, and you'll have access to data fetching primitives, as well as the context if you'd like to uh, set headers from within the data source itself. We're also planning on introducing some new features over the next couple weeks, like error metrics and tracing grouped by data source, which will allow you to gain full visibility into what's happening with your data sources in Apollo Engine. The new data source API is actually already available for you to play with in the new release candidate. So definitely try it out uh, and let us know what you think. We're super excited to receive feedback on this. So I've used the term partial query caching a couple times. Um, so let's actually see what this looks like in practice. It's really helpful for data that's a mix of static and dynamic. So here in this example, we have some movie data. And most of it is static, things like the title and the description uh, that doesn't really change. But then we have some user data attached um, that uh, shows the progress of the, the playback rate. And that's dynamic. So this query here is actually calling a REST endpoint wrapped with the Apollo Server data source API. So here's what it looks like when you first run it. And you can see that tracing data at the bottom, uh, all the resolvers are being called here. So the second time that you run it, all the static data is actually cached. And we only have to fetch the dynamic data, as you can see from the resolver tracing stats at the bottom. So this is par partial query caching at work, uh, thanks to the new Apollo Server data source API. And we are super excited about this direction. So data sources kind of simplify server development at the bottom of the stack. But what can we do to simplify development at the schema level? How do we ensure that as we're uh, evolving our schema over time, that we're not breaking our UI? And that's where Apollo's new schema management tools come in. So all you have to do is specify a list of validation rules for your schema, and Apollo's server will actually check each change that you make against those rules. So this allows you to safely refactor, add fields, deprecate fields, and clean up code with confidence that you haven't broken every anything. 
And our schema validation actually integrates with GitHub, so it's a total naturally, uh, it's naturally a part of your existing CI workflow. We hope to create even more uh, extension points in the future, um, perhaps even in your editor and beyond, to optimize collaboration between front-end and back-end engineers. Not only will back-end engineers love our new schema collaboration features, they can also take advantage of schema monitoring from within Apollo Engine in order to determine which queries need to be optimized. So Apollo Engine actually provides field-by-field -field monitoring for your entire schema so that it not only allows you to see how much time uh, your resolvers take, but also um, to see how often a field is being used. Perhaps um, you know, if you're looking to deprecate something, that's a really helpful metric to see there. So many teams have told us uh, that th this is something that they've been uh, really wanting. They've wanted better tools to manage their schema. So we're super excited to see where this is heading in the next couple months. We kind of see a sample workflow looking a little bit like this. If a front-end developer wants to add a field based on the needs of their UI, they can submit a pull request, which then will alert a back-end engineer of the change. The backend engineer can then use our GitHub checks integration to ensure that any schema changes the front end engineer is making are non breaking. And then they can use the schema validation report combined with metrics from Apollo Engine to offer feedback on the change. And we think this end to end workflow will not only improve uh, product productivity, but also increase collaboration between both front end and back end developers. So another reason to use Apollo Server for your GraphQL layer is pretty soon you'll be able to actually run GraphQL on the edge. So this is something uh, really experimental that we've been working on, but I think it's super cool. It uses Cloudflare's new worker platform to actually run Apollo Server in a truly serverless environment. And this allows you to use the data source API that we just saw earlier to cache whole query responses from within your CDN and then cache partial query responses on the edge, which delivers data to your users faster. Uh, so if you'd like to be on the list for early access, definitely uh, check out apollographql.com slash edge to be on the list. Um, and we would love to hear your feedback as we start to roll this out. So with better visibility into our GraphQL APIs through a comprehensive tooling story and also reducing the steps it takes to build and deploy a GraphQL layer into production, I think we'll be able to make both front-end and back-end teams happy in the end. I think between data sources, schema management, and running GraphQL on the edge, we are super excited with this new direction and would love to hear all of your thoughts on what the next generation of GraphQL servers could look like. And finally, if you're looking for information to take back to your team, definitely check out our new learning resources at apollographql.com slash docs. We're going to be building this out much more over the next couple weeks, but right now it features implementation guides with best practices for topics like authentication, testing, schema design, state management, as well as comprehensive getting started guides uh, for Apollo Server 2.0 and then also Apollo Client as well. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to come find me later. I'm wearing this Ask Me About Apollo shirt. I'm pretty easy to spot, or uh, any of my other colleagues. Thank you all so much. Thank you.